Good afternoon. It is Friday, June 23. Welcome to Discovering Victory Podcast. This is your opportunity to hear messages that have been preached from the pulpit of America's Keswick, from America's greatest preachers. We're happy today to share with you a message from, how do you pick your most favorite speaker? I don't know how you do that. They're all my favorites. Sometimes I just close my eyes and go like that. Yeah, but Dave <laughs> Edwards has been coming here for a number yeah, of years. Yeah, he's up there. Started out teaching for our singles events, and then we said, look, this is, this yeah. is too good. He's got to come and be a part yeah. of our family weeks. This is part one from his Thursday evening message last summer He's going to be here Labor Day weekend this year, but let's listen to Dr. Dave Edwards as he unpacks the Word of God for us today on Discovering Victory podcast. I got to sit in with the band, everybody. How about that? That was great fun. I enjoyed that. Well, has it been a good week for everybody? I have to say, you know, I've spoken here a lot of years. I'm looking forward to being back in 2023. If you, I, I will, We want you to come back that weekend. I'm going to do all new talks and all new material, so it'll all be new, all right? So you hear brand new stuff, which is very cool. I always knew Bill Welty was an incredible guy, but I learned to respect him even more as a leader to watch how he led Keswick through the COVID season. And I, I know we've already done it. Would you just thank Bill Welty for his leadership? We're on the other side of COVID, and Keswick is still here. There's a lot of churches and a lot of places that didn't make it through that pandemic. And it, was, it all was determined, who made it was all determined on leadership. So anyway, thank you, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it, I'm looking forward to being back. If you got your Bibles tonight, I'm gonna to ask you to uh, flip open to Matthew. And we're, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna read you a story tonight. And um, we'll get to it in a minute. You know, I've traveled, of course I told you every, you know, every session I've traveled a lot. And so a lot of my experiences are travel related. And I told you as I travel around, I, I constantly meet people who don't get it, people that are clueless. And I had somebody uh, turn into me a clueless uh, thing, and I want to read this to you right quick. This says, uh, in the 1950s, a car owner's manual gave instructions on how to adjust the valves in the engine. Today, the 2022 owner's manual says, don't drink the contents of the battery. All right, so that's kind of where we've, that's where we've descended to. And so, you know, I, I, I'm constantly kind of aware of this thing. I, I ate, uh, I had Mexican food today. I went into town and I found a really sketchy place like next to a bus station or something like that. And, uh, and that's, my, that's my favorite thing in the world to eat. And I, I don't know, how the, I mean, the menu was four or five pages long and there's only three items in Mexican food, right? If it's this, it's a tostada. If it's this, it's a taco. If it's this, it's an enchilada. That's, that's all there is. They have five or six pages of stuff. And so I, uh, I order, so I walk in and the lady says, would you like to be seated? I'm like, no, I'll just lie here on the floor and you slide me the food, how would that be? <laughs> and so they take, me to the, they take me to the table and the guy says, uh, would you like to see a menu? I was like, no, I'll just call out food items so you go, we have that one. And uh, so I picked out what I wanted. So I ordered uh, veggie fajitas, all right? So I'm, I'm gonna do my exchange with the guy. So I said, uh, I'd like to have the uh, veggie fajitas. He goes, beef? I said, do the veggie fajitas usually come with beef? How does that work? And uh, anyway, so we live in a world of people who don't get it. And if you look for it, you start reading stuff, you'll find it. I have a, uh, I forgot to bring it with me tonight, but my deodorant, I have a thing of Old Spice deodorant at back in my room. And Old Spice de deodorant on the back of it it has a warning and it says, step number one, remove cap. All right, we're off to a good start. It tells you what to do and how to use it. At the bottom of the thing, at the bottom of the little solid deodorant thing, it says, keep this and all other drugs out of reach of children. <laughs> Can somebody tell me when Old Spice became a drug? What is that about? When's the last time you met an Old Spice dealer? It came up to you and went, come on, bro, do a line with me. All right, I mean, honestly. If you look for it, you'll find it. And so the other thing I've learned is that, that, that life is different in different parts of the world, you know. And uh, I, I spoke at a bunch of churches in California for a while, and I learned while I was out there that they kind of have their own terms, and their terms have their own meanings. And one of their terms in California is called dude. They say dude all the time. Can everyone just say that with me on three? One, two, three. Dude. They say it all the time. And so, like, if you go to Hawaii, their word is aloha. And aloha can mean a lot of different things. It can be, you know, hello or come here or get away from me. Well, in California, dude has the same kind of levels of meaning. 
And so before you go home, I want to teach you the different uses for the word dude so you can use it to drive your kids nuts, all right? So dude can mean a lot of different things. Dude can, dude can mean hello, dude. Dude can mean come here, dude. Dude can mean I don't know, dude. Dude can mean you're in big, big stinking trouble, dude. Dude can mean there's someone in my closet with a knife, dude. So when you go home, just feel free to work that in, all right? So that's my gift for me to you, all right? So the thing about, you know, the interesting thing about COVID was how it changed things. Did you, I mean, can you believe it with the, did you ever think there'd be a day in your life when you would go into a bank and everybody would have mask on? Everybody in the bank? I always had to go, no, no, I, I'm here to cast a check. He's here to rob the place. It's a different, it's a different thing. I don't know what's going on, right? And one of the worst things you could do, I told you, uh, you at the first night that I was not a counselor, but you know, when people said, oh, I'm struggling through this season, or I'm having a tough times, one of the worst things you can say to someone is, well, you just need to have more faith. Uh, it, that, in so many ways, that crushes a lot of people because it makes people feel like, well, maybe the problem is I don't have enough faith. Maybe I'm not really, maybe I'm not really believing like I should. And that leads people down all these rabbit holes. Like maybe I'm not saying the right words in the right order. Or maybe I just don't mean it deeply enough. Or God's not answering my prayers because I don't have enough faith. And someone, when someone brings that issue up and they make that statement, it triggers all this insecurity. And most people, when it comes to this idea of having faith, they, they, they tend to back away from it. We, we tend to think of someone with great faith as someone who's in a different denominational category than us, that's someone who's more gregarious and loud and more outgoing. We, we have these ideas about what it means to be a person of faith, and for most people, we don't fit into that category. Whatever we think of great faith, we automatically think, well, that's not me. Maybe there's other people who have great faith, but not me. And we tend to shy away from it. But what if tonight I told you, you already had great faith? You already had great faith inside of you. You already have it. Because when Paul writes about the issue of faith, he says that there's been a measure of faith allotted to each of us. That God gives us the ability to have faith in him. That he's the one who, faith is a gift. It's not something that we work up. Faith is a gift. It's not something that we have to pace the floor back and forth hoping that we can get our faith up and believe better and believe deeper. Instead, God gives us faith, and then that faith is surfaced through different types of circumstances. So instead of me telling you you need to have more faith, what if I just told you tonight you were already a great man of faith, that you're already a great woman of faith, that it's already inside of you, and maybe the circumstances have covered it up. Maybe our false beliefs about what faith is and what people who have faith look like, maybe that's, maybe that's camouflaged it. Maybe it's the fact that we've just never been familiar with faith in our life. We, we've been familiar with other parts of church and other parts of theology, but not faith. But what if I told you tonight that you already have inside of you great faith? It just needs to be brought out. God's granted each of us the ability to believe in him. It's not something you have to go get or even grow into. God's given us the ability to do it. And this story in the book of Matthew is a story about great faith. It's one of the few people, it's a story about one of the few people that left Jesus speechless. It's about a woman from an idolatrous town. And the way that she interacts with Jesus, he says, I've never seen someone with such great faith. That only happened two times in Jesus' ministry. They met people that he said, man, you have great faith. Imagine what it would be like to have the Son of God say to you, you have great faith, because that's what he's saying to you tonight. That you are a man of great faith. You are a woman of great faith. It is inside of you. He's given you the ability to believe in him. It just has to be surfaced. It has to be brought up. Something has to happen to trigger it. So I, I, I want to read this story tonight, and, uh, and then we'll go back and we'll look at what great faith is. Ready? Right? Here, here we go. Number one, uh, here, what, let's read the story. Here we go. Look at this. This is Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. All right? So now, Jesus has just left a big argument with a bunch of religious people. All right? So he's, he's, he's told them that, they're, that, they're, that they're, their heart is not in what they're doing. 
that they're going through the motions, but the motions don't, don't have any meaning, and that the proof of the fact that they don't really know what they're saying is that their life is not producing anything that looks close to the love of God in any way. So Jesus has had this huge, basically, conflict with the most religious people of the day, so he's tired. He's worn out. How many people know that arguing with someone, especially a religious person, will take it out of you? Anybody know that? They're hard to argue with. And, and so Jesus has had, basically had his fill of it. And he leaves that scene and he, go, he journeys to the outskirts of Tyon and Sidon to get some rest. He, gets, he finds a little place that is situated up on the rocks, out by the coast, and he's out in enemy te territory and he's resting. And word begins to spread through the town that Jesus is out on the coast. And a woman who lived in this idolatrous town, this town filled with rich, witchcraft and idol worship, makes her way out to where Jesus is. This is what this story is about. You ready? So oh, look at this. Here we go. Matthew 15, verse 21. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. So he's going to get some rest. Anybody ever ask you how you slept last night? Anybody ever do that? I just sleep last night. I'll, I always say, I need more practice, and uh, I need to do it some more. And so Jesus went to get some rest, all right? He was tired, tired of the conflict, tired of all that stuff. And a Canaanite woman from that region, right? So Canaanite is, is pointing us to the fact that she is not a believer, right? She is from this, this city that is filled with pagan worship and pagan idolatry and all types of crazy beliefs. So she is coming out of a situation that is not necessarily has anything to do with God. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what Matthew's ladies know, Canaanite woman, that's what that means. A Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon possessed. So she's in a place facing something that she can't fix. Got it? Verse 23, but he did not answer her a word. Jesus didn't answer. He did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps crying, sh shouting out. Send her away, like, silence this woman and get her out of here. Look, look at verse 24, look at it. And he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He's calling her a dog, all right? This is scandalous on the internet. This is a big deal. This blew the internet up. We'll get to it in a minute of why you can't trust anything in the, on the internet, ready? Right? It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And at that moment, Jesus' breath is taken away. What a response. She pushes past the objections and says, yeah, that's right. I am a dog. I'm an outsider. I don't really belong here. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs. Look at this. And Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, look at this phrase. Your faith is great. What would it be to draw a compliment like that from the Son of God? Your faith is great and it shall be done for you as you wish and her daughter was healed at once this little story tucked away in the gospel of matthew gives us a map of how great faith comes about in our life the way what this woman said and what got her to interact with jesus has within it the principles and the characteristics of what triggers great faith inside of us. And so if you're a note taker tonight, right across the top of your page, I just want you to write undivided colon the journey to great faith. Undivided the journey to great faith because that's what this text is about. It shows us how we tap into the faith that God's already given us. So here we go. No, there's, four things, right? They all start with the letter T, kids. So here we go. Number one, great faith. Great faith is triggered by desperation. 
Now, I use the word triggered on purpose because we live in a culture where everybody's triggered by everything. People are triggered by colors, they're triggered by weather, they're triggered by words. I, I spoke at a university somewhere, I won't say where, and I did a chapel service there, and I was talking, I was talking about the ministry of Jesus out of the book of Philippians. And I said that he was uh, controlled by the interests of God the Father. And so, I mean, I, I used a word that was in the text, and afterwards, this, this student came up to me and she said, you know, when you use the word controlled, it makes me feel unsafe. And, I, and she said, could you do, if you could just not ever use that word again in any of your sermons, that would be great. And I said, let me pray about that. No. All right. And, all uh, right. <laughs> Please. Right. So everybody's triggered by something. And great faith is triggered by desperation. Look what, look what this says about her. And Jesus went away, and a Canaanite woman came, to, came out and began to cry out, Have mercy on me, for my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Here's her situation. She's living in a region in which all of the false gods didn't do anything for her daughter. Her daughter is demon-possessed, under attack by the kingdom of evil, and all the idols in this woman's town, all the witch doctors, all the, all the people that, that, that offered ideas, nothing had worked. Every means that she tried, all the medicine, all the doctors, all, all the priests, all the idol worshipers, every road for this woman was a dead end. She was out of options. She was desperate to get her daughter back. And it was that situation that caused her to get out of her city and go out to where Jesus was. Look what the text says about this. Look, look, at, look at verse 22. And a Canaanite white woman from that region, look at this phrase, came out. Came out. She journeyed out of her city, out of her old pagan religious beliefs, out of the constraints of that evil place, outside on a neutral territory, outside in the borderlands, by the coast, up on the rocks, to where Jesus was, because what faith does is it always moves us out towards the Lord. She went out. It was faith that triggered her that to move out to where Jesus was. This is what faith does. This great faith always moves us towards the Lord. It moves us out of our situation and up towards where God is. It's interesting. It was the desperation of her situation that brought her to the door of Jesus. desperation plus direction will always take us to the door of Jesus. A desperation is not always good. Desperation can take you in a lot of terrible directions. Just desperation run amok in our life can take us down a lot of dead ends and take us down a lot of dark holes and dead end alleys. It can take you into addiction. It can take you into bad relationship decisions. It can take you into bad financial decisions. Desperation, just desperation run amok in our life can take us in a lot of different places. But desperation with direction always take us to the door of Jesus. It's interesting, in Revelation, Jesus stands on the outside of the door knocking. But in this story, Je Jesus is on the inside and the woman's on the outside knocking on the door, wanting to see Jesus. Let me ask you tonight, what are you desperate about? What are you facing that sucks the wind out of you? What are you facing that drains the life out of you, that when you look at it, when you think about it, and you think, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. That desperation needs some direction. And that we take what is making us desperate and we direct it towards the Lord. Great faith is always triggered by a desperate situation. So this, is, this story is proof that the kingdom of Jesus is populated by unlikely people unlikely people underestimated people that this woman from a place that has nothing to do with God or Jesus in her situation it triggered great faith the kingdom of God is populated by unusual and unlikely people and this is why we should never give up on the people that God loves we should never give up on the people that look like they may not have great faith because within them there is great faith. And I came tonight to tell you that there's great faith inside of you, but it has to be triggered by desperation. So let me ask you tonight, what are you desperate about? What are you desperate about? What is it that gnaws away at you at nighttime and you think, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. 
that we can't worry those things away. You know, a lot of people get into this, if you've ever watched a phone buffer and try to get a signal, right? That's what a lot of people's minds does. They, they, they go in a circle, they worry, how am I gonna break, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna get out of this? And they just think around, 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 around. And instead of being caught up in that cycle, we have to give some direction to our desperation and head out to Jesus. Faith will always take us up out of our circumstances towards the Lord. You see it? It's triggered. Great faith is triggered by desperation. Triggered by desperation. Not only that, but number two, it's tested by discouragement. Great faith will always be tested by discouragement. Now, you know, one of the things that I learned while I was reading, studying about this text that people lost their minds on the internet because it looks like Jesus is being so mean and so cruel to this woman. Right, that, he, that the disciples try to send her away, Jesus calls her a dog. But you know what I learned, that in, in this culture, when someone came at a rabbi and said, I, 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 I want to know your God, the person that was pursuing the rabbi was tested with this conversation. So what was happening is that Jesus is having a conversation the way every rabbi have a conversation with someone who wasn't a Jew, who was an outsider, who was trying to seek him. So he's not being mean, he's not, but he is testing her. He's, he's putting weight on her decision. He's wanting, he's testing the faith. And you have to know that great faith is always tested by discouragement. So when you go through discouraging time, it doesn't mean that the faith isn't working. It means that God's putting weight on it to make it stronger. God's putting weight on it to give it definition. Our faith gets tested by discouragement. If you're taking notes, let's look at the things that her faith gets tested by. Look at this. It's tested by silence. But look what this says. Look at this. Uh, and look at verse 22. And crying out and saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon possessed. Look at verse 23. But he did not answer her a word. Jesus didn't say one thing to her. And God will use silence to test us. I asked you this last night, but how many of you guys have a memory of taking a test at any time in your life? Anybody have a memory? Middle school, high school, taking a test? What is the one thing that all tests, whether a pop quiz or a formal test, the one thing that all tests have in common is that when the test is being given, the teacher is silent. And that's what's going on. He's testing her faith. He's putting weight on it. And your faith sometimes will be tested by the silence of God. It's not rejection. It's not that God doesn't care. Can, can you read this line and think, this is my Jesus, this is Jesus that we all think about, this compassionate Jesus who sees the crowd and is moved with compassion and now looks at this woman who's dealing with something that's way outside of her control and he doesn't say anything? It's because it's a test. And when the test is being given, the teacher is always silent. So you can't let that throw you. And then it's tested by other people, by other people, right? So your faith will be tested by silence, by, by, by other people. Look what this says. He didn't answer the word. And the disciples kept imploring him, saying, send her away. People in your own life will test your faith by what they say to you. They may say that Jesus is a myth and that you're making all this up or that you're, you're not that kind of person or they remember you from back in the day. They may try to put you in some category of the way you were back in the day. They may, they may say something that is discouraging to you. But in our life, our faith will be tested by the reactions of other people. And we can't let that throw us off. If someone says something cynical, if someone says something jaded about believing in Jesus or about having faith, you just got to know it's a test. You know, one of the, I had a friend of mine give me a membership to a gym for my birthday, all right? So if someone gives you a membership to a gym, I mean, that's not a gift that says you care. That's a gift that says you're fat, right? That's all, I mean, that's, that's what that's saying. And uh, this is years ago, and I, it was like this chain of gyms. And so one of the places I tried it out was in Knoxville, Tennessee, and it, part of this deal was you get a trainer. You got, you know, they they give you a trainer for the day or whatever while you were there. And uh, so, you know, I show up and I, I clearly don't belong in the gym. I mean, I, I clearly don't fit. I don't have that look that I like, like I need to be there. And, there, and I, one thing I learned about the gym is that, you know, 
the bigger the muscles the guys have, the crazier the clothes they wear. I don't know what this is about. But the bigger the guys are, the more insane and clownish their clothes are. And uh, so, like I show up, I've got like navy blue sweats on. <laughs> oh, I, I, it's obvious, I, you know, everything's new. I'm that guy with everything matching. It's ridiculous. And there's a guy who's like, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's like just ripped and chiseled or whatever you want to call it. He's a giant guy, you know, and, and he's got a six pack and, you know, I'm standing there with a two liter, you know what I mean? And that is not good. And so, and, uh, and but this guy comes over, he's got those yellow uh, flash dance socks on, those poofy dance socks, and then lime green shorts that are cut like way up like this. And then a pink, I think it was a tank top, but it was mainly string with like some fabric right here. It was just like string and fabric right there. And he comes over to me and goes, hey bro, can you spot me? I was like, spot you? I saw you right when I came in. You're dressed like a clown. What is that outfit about? So, anyway, I found a machine that I could do. I was like, I, was like, I can do this machine. I said to the trainer, I can do this. What is this? He goes, well, that's the vacuum cleaner. I was like, oh, I don't know. All right, and so I, it was terrible, and then, I, you know, I was at some, I forget, I, I went to some place and I did a, like a step aerobics class, which is even more awkward because, you know, with my dyslexia, the room is going right and I'm going left. It was, it was terrible. And while I'm in this step class, out of the corner of my eye, I see a guy down the road who's worse than me. And I think, I'm so relieved until I found out that I was next to a mirror. And I was like, that, that guy is me, that's not good. And, uh, then I, w I, I kept trying. I, mean, I, I was consistent in my effort, and, but I, uh, I, I was at some gym, and they, the trainer said, okay, we're going uh, to go do free weights. I don't know why they call them free weights when they charge you to use them. And anyway, so we're going to do free weights. So he has me lay down on the bench, and we're doing like a bench press thing, you know, and it, he, he like lifts it off and puts it on my hands, and he says, okay, now I'm going to count it out, right? And so he starts counting it out, and I, I was good for like the first couple, you know, and then my arms start going like this, you know, like I get one side up and the other side catches up. And this guy is over the top of me going, come on, bro. It's all you. It's all you, bro. I said, it needs to be a little more you. And it needs to be you are going to lift this off of me. Well, listen, this is what it's like when our faith is tested. That the weight of silence is placed on us. That the weight of other people's words are placed on us. And then look at this, the weight of refusal. The weight of refusal. Look, look, look at this. Look, look what he says. And he, uh, and, and he says, but I, he answered and said, verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <laughs> he, was, he, he says to this woman, I don't have a covenant with you. You're not in my loop of people that I came to reach. You're not, you're not Jewish. You're not in this covenant. And that's the point. The point is he's, he's singling out something that she can't do anything about. That's not her choice. She didn't get to choose what group she was born into or what her ethnicity was. But faith is the great equalizer. This is the point of the text, is that anybody anywhere can come to Christ. Faith is the equal ground that we all stand on. Thankfully, the Bible doesn't say only the smart people can come to God or only those who have never screwed up can come to God or only those that are perfect or made an X amount of money in their lifetime. Faithfully, it just says, we just put our faith in it. So, James, like, uh, <laughs> this is pretty cool. I thought I heard some music. Do -do, <laughs> do -do, do -do, do -do. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. We're so in. explain what this is all about. So this is, this is up for our theme uh, for this summer, which is anchored faithful through the ages. So it's a nautical theme. So we're just swimming through it. Dora. <laughs> Dora, yeah, yeah. Woo. So I'm going to tell them a little bit about the summer. Yeah, let's do it. Theme is anchored, and we have our family weeks coming up. Um, please take advantage. We do have rooms available. Um, this is being recorded a little bit later. This is being recorded early. So call guest services, 800-453-7942. Uh, you can get on a waiting list for some of the rooms, and then we have rooms in Victory Hall which if it's your first time, it's 50% off. So take advantage of coming out uh, to experience a summer at Keswick. Family week one is July 9th, and then they, will, the, the next, the, the, they start concurrently uh, each week. So July 9th, July 16th, July 23rd, 
So I think my math is right. Yeah, your math is right. <laughs> so July 1, the first family week, who's speaking? Jim Lang and Phil Tuttle, for, they'll both be doing Walk Through the Bible. Okay, week two. Reverend Frank Cerrone and Dr. Walt Wiley. Okay, great week. Week three. Dr. Tony Hart, Dr. Richard, Richard Allen Farmer. Oh, wow, how do you choose? Okay, you week don't. four. <laughs> Pastor Brian Bill and Dr. Ray Pritchard. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so Brian Bill is on the board at Keep Believing Ministries. Beautiful. And uh, we're so looking forward to him being here. He is an amazing... Wow, I, I don't know. Okay, week five. Week five is... I know Dr. Roger Wilmore is going to be here. James Mindling. Thank Pastor you. James. And this is his first time here in America. Okay. Keswick as well. Uh, wonderful pastor from the Virginia area. Can't wait to hear him. He loves the Keswick message. And uh, we're looking forward to him being here for the first time. For information, call 1-800-453-7942 or visit our website, www.americaskeswick.org. Come back and join us Monday for Worship Live right here at America's Keswick. <laughs> we can do the wave. Right. So God bless.